Good afternoon. My name is Frances Ruan, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to this webinar, which is co-organised by the Institute for International European Affairs and the European Commission representation in Ireland. As many of you will know, in July um, this year, the President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, visited Ireland. And on that visit, she announced the Commission's approval of one billion in funding to help finance Ireland's recovery from COVID-19. The funding is drawn from the Next Generation EU Fund, which is the EU's 750 billion plus recovery fund. And the fund aims to support a sustainable, equitable recovery across the EU, as well as to advance the digital and green transitions over the next decade. So it's dual, dual in its focus, it's strategic looking forward, but it's also dealing with the recovery. Um, so we're delighted this afternoon to be joined live from the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform in Dublin by the European Commission for the Economy, Paolo Gentiloni, who is currently on a visit to Ireland, and some of you will have seen him on the television and on the media over the last couple of days, and also by the Minister for Public Expenditure and Reform, Michael McGrath. And in their joint address today, Commissioner um, Gentiloni and Minister McGrath will discuss how this new fund will foster a resilient and a fair recovery across the EU and support a transformation in Irish society. So we're grateful to both of them for taking the time out from their busy schedules, and it is indeed a busy schedule during this visit, and are delighted that, in fact, this is their second occasion this year in being involved in an IAEA function. So it's really very generous of them to do this, and it's a great opportunity for you to hear their thoughts. So um, this is the first hybrid event uh, the IEA has run since the onset of the pandemic. So if I feel a bit nervous, it's because I've been told I'm a guinea pig. Uh, but it's great to be able to begin the process of bringing back the type of event we knew pre-COVID and more importantly, combining it online uh, to be, get to much, much larger audiences than was possible in the past. And um, we're very grateful to the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform for hosting this event for, for us. So we will begin with the address by Commissioner Gentiloni, followed by Minister McGrath. They'll both speak for about 15 minutes, and then we'll go into a Q&A session with the audience. Uh, you'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with now, and you should see it on your screen. So please feel free to send your questions in throughout the session as they occur to you. You don't have to wait until things are done or the speeches are finished to send in questions, and we will come to them once Mr McGrath has finished his presentation. Uh, please, when asking your questions, make sure to identify both your name and your affiliation along with the question. So a reminder to all of you that today's presentation and the Q&A session is on the record and also to say that the IIEA welcomes your tweeting about the event using the handle at IIEA. So let me turn first to formally introduce Commissioner Gentiloni. Um, he has been European Commissioner for the Economy since December 2019. Before that he had a distinguished political career in Italy serving as Prime Minister from 2016 to 2018, Minister for Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation from 2014 to 2016, Minister of the Committee on Foreign Affairs of the Chambers of Deputies from 2013 to 2014, and Minister for Communications from 2006 to 2008. Prior to his political career, he worked as a journalist, and anyone who heard him speak on RTE yesterday morning will have seen his excellent journalistic skills in action on that occasion. So he's also a graduate in political science from La Sapienza University in Rome. So Commissioner, if I could ask you to go to the podium and deliver your address, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Frances, and, uh, and thank you, Michael, uh, for, for your hospitality and for having me here today. Uh, this is my first bilateral visit to a member state since the start of the pandemic. Um, and it's important, the fact that we can finally have these uh, uh, meetings. Uh, because this also shows that we are moving in the right direction. And hopefully by the next time I come to Dublin, it, I will be able to meet all of you in person. More than 70% of adults in the EU are now fully vaccinated. In Ireland, that figure is impressive, more than 90%. And Europe's successful vaccination campaign is underpinning a strong economic rebound. Growth is accelerating in Ireland and in the EU, with the expansion in 2021 as whole likely to exceed our already robust forecast. 
by the way, this morning OECD uh, published a, their more recent forecast and uh, their expectation for uh, the euro area is of a 5.3% growth, which is slightly uh, higher than our previous forecast. But we share this uh, optimism. And I stress the fact that these figures are comparable with the one of uh, the United States. Uh, a few months ago, we were in a very, very different situation. Of course, we have to build on this positive momentum. And our aim is to put our economies on a more sustained and sustainable growth path. So not just a rebound, which could be already there, practically, uh, sooner or later in different member states, but a stable and sustainable growth. And this is where the next generation EU and the Recovery and Resilience Facility um, enters uh, with their importance. Uh, next generation EU is an unprecedented response uh, and as you said, Frances, it is mobilizing up to 800 billion euros in grants and loans uh, in current price. And this is a unique opportunity for all Europe to build back better, as we say, and to drive forward the green and digital transitions. The first disbursement of these funds to EU member states started over the summer and will continue in the coming months and years. We have so far disbursed approximately 50 billion euros in pre-financing, money raised by issuing common bonds which have been heavily oversubscribed every time. And this is in itself a tremendous success that we will continue in the next weeks and months also with the emission of green bonds. With around 1 billion euros in grants, Ireland's recovery and resilience plan is of course relatively small, but it is no less ambitious for that. Ireland plan includes a set of important reforms and investment that we are confident will contribute to effectively addressing a significant subset of the economic and social challenges outlined in the country-specific recommendations Ireland in recent years, which is one of the fundamental criteria for the Commission assessment of the plans. The plans include reforms in the area of social and affordable housing, health, pensions and the business environment, and it introduces measures that are expected to partially address challenges in the areas of anti-money laundering and aggressive tax planning. The plan includes investments to stimulate research and innovation, promote private investment as well as targeted measure to develop skills and support employment. Most importantly, I think Ireland plan devotes 42% of the total allocation to measures to uh, support climate objectives while 32% of its total allocation is for measures that support the digital transition. So it's very much concentrated in those priorities, the strategic priorities that at European level uh, we think could give an added value to our economies. Because of course the amount of money is crucial, but how do we use this money? Do we use it in strategic priorities, uh, I think also to fill gaps that we have in our competitiveness, I think it's very important. Irish businesses tend to benefit from this plan both directly and indirectly. Directly through measures to promote private investment and funding for research and innovation or programs to invest in firms' digital transformation as well as reforms to reduce barriers to doing business. And indirectly, through investments and reforms that will more broadly improve the business climate. For example, when it comes to the upskillings and reskillings of workers. We should also not forget the importance of the spillover effects that this coordinated growth and transformation effort all over the single market will bring about. 
the European Commission have given, has given its green light to the Iran plan, which is fully aligned with our common priorities. It's now time to implement the ambitious measure contained in the plan. As I believe you say, and we say the same in my country, a good start is half of the work. So our priority over the coming months and years will be to make sure that these plans are implemented in full, especially in the countries that are receiving larger amount of money, but in each and every member states. Before I wrap up, a few words now on EU fiscal policy. Europe's response to the economic shock caused by COVID-19 could scarcely have been more different to what happened during the previous crisis, which hit Ireland so hard. This time, an unprecedented shock was met with a swift, strong and coordinated common response from the EU institutions. And I, I think that both the EU institution and national governments could be proud of this reaction. There was a well-balanced, and also this was new, complementarity between fiscal and monetary policies that was absent, unfortunately, a decade ago. Now, we must avoid repeating the mistake of a decade ago when support was withdrawn too soon and too abruptly. Of course, we must have more targeted, more selective support but we must calibrate very carefully the transition from emergency support to more targeted measures. We also need to ensure that our fiscal rules and our economic governance framework are fit for purpose in the post-pandemic world. With public debt levels having risen markedly and investment needs having continued to increase, especially those related to the green transition. As confirmed last week by President von der Leyen, in the coming weeks we will reopen the public consultation on our fiscal rules and governance framework, taking into account the input we will receive and the discussion we will hold with the Member States over the next couple of months, we will then assess how to move forward. Uh, thank you and gure mov aguit. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't know how the pronunciation <coughs> was, but... God of Mahagat, it was lovely. It was really I tried. Good. Thank you. So we will, the next time you're here, um, we'll, we'll explain too small Latin Hebrew, which is your half the battle uh, is the work that, that starts well. Um, so thank you very much for that. And I think it is, it is good to remind ourselves actually of the fact that we did learn from what happened uh, 10 years ago, a decade ago, and we've actually done so much better this time. And I think that the learning from that experience was, has, has, been, has been very real. And it's not just, it's just, just not, not say so. I think it's, it's very substantial. So I'd like uh, next to welcome Minister Michael McGrath, who is the Minister for Public Expenditure and Reform, and he's TD for Cork South Central. He was first elected to the Doyle Air in 2007 and has been re-elected in every election since then. And to those of you familiar with Irish politics will know that that's no mean achievement. Um, in his time in the Doyle, he has served as opposition finance spokesperson and on a number of Oireachtas committees. As minister since 2020, he oversees close to 90 billion of government spending, which will of course be related to the spending coming from the EU. The implementation of the National Development Plan and also the programme for public service reform. So it's a very broad mandate that, that, he, that he covers out in this, in, this, in this role. So Minister, over to you to address us. Thank you. Francis, thank you very much for uh, the kind uh, introduction. Um, Commissioner Gentiloni, you're very welcome. And I am uh, genuinely very pleased to take part in this event this afternoon and to welcome you all uh, virtually at least uh, to the Whitaker Room here in Merrion Street. And I do want to thank the IIEA and the Commission representation in Dublin and indeed the staff in my own department for all of the work that they have put in to make this event here today uh, a reality. And I am particularly pleased to welcome uh, Commissioner Gentiloni to Dublin and here to the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform to discuss Ireland's National Recovery and Resilience Plan. Uh, T.K. Whitaker, whose portrait hangs in the wall here in this room, was of course a pioneer of economic development 
at a time of great economic challenge for Ireland and we are all still in inspired by him. The last 18 months have seen Ireland, Europe and the world face an extraordinary challenge, namely the COVID-19 pandemic and requiring an extraordinary response at a national as well as an international level. At a national level, the 2020 Programme for Government set out the ambition and the actions required to meet the, this challenge and to repair the damage that had been inflicted by the pandemic. And in many ways, the pandemic has acted as a catalyst for enabling future change and allowing Ireland to build back uh, society and the economy uh, in a manner that is sustainable. As our successful vaccination programme allows us progressively to reopen the economy, the government's economic recovery plan has set out how we will support the full resumption of economic activity and to help people to get back to work. And we are making very substantial progress in that regard. Allied with the National Development Plan and building on the extensive supports the government has put in place since the start of the pandemic, the Economic Recovery Plan sets out a new phase of supports, investment and policies for a new stage of economic recovery and renewal. In recognition of the extraordinary impact of the pandemic, the full range of tools at the government's disposal have been used and indeed continue to be used, including income supports, grants, reliefs, taxation measures and loan guarantees, so as to protect workers and their incomes and support businesses through the pandemic and beyond. Meanwhile, at a European level, the 800 million, billion euro next generation EU recovery package represents an unprecedented response by the European Union to the global pandemic. It represents Europe's shared response to the public health and economic and social crises caused by COVID. Next Generation EU is an ambitious and common recovery package that will complement and support each member state's own national response to the crisis. At the heart of Next Generation EU lies the Recovery and Resilience Facility, the aim of which is to address the economic and social impact of the pandemic and make European economies and societies more sustainable, more resilient and better prepared for the challenges and opportunities of the green and digital transitions. Ireland will receive approximately 915 million euro in grants from the Recovery and Resilience Facility and these grants will be used to support investments between now and mid-2026. A further set of grants will be allocated to each member state in 2023, taking into account economic developments between now and then. Ireland's plan has been developed by the government in close cooperation with the Commission, taking into account the RRF prioritisation of green and digital transition, as the Commissioner has alluded to, and the challenges identified as part of the European semester process. I would like to thank uh, the Commissioner and the Commission Services for their excellent cooperation in developing Ireland's plan. I was very pleased to meet uh, Commission President uh, Ursula von der Leyen when she travelled to Dublin in July to present the Commission's positive assessment of Ireland's plan to the Taoiseach. I was also pleased to join my colleague uh, Pascal Donoghue, who I know the Commissioner knows uh, very well, at the recent meeting of ECOFIN when Ireland's plan was discussed and I was delighted that our plan received approval by the Council. The overall objective of Ireland's National Recovery and Resilience Plan is to contribute to a sustainable, equitable, green and digital recovery in a manner that complements and supports the government's broader recovery effort. The plan is aligned with domestic policies such as the Economic Recovery Plan and the National Development Plan, uh, which is currently under review and which will see very significant investment in our public capital programme in the years ahead. Consistent with the NRRP, the priorities for the NDP include reform, sustainability, regional development, innovation, skills and climate action. Ireland's plan is based on 25 investment projects and reform measures spanning three core priority areas addressing green and digital transition along with social and economic recovery and job creation. Each priority contains a set of impactful and reinforcing investments and reforms. Let me turn first to advancing the green transition. The next number of years are critical if Ireland is to address the climate and biodiversity crisis that threatens the safe future of our planet. Ireland's ambitions, uh, ambition is to more than halve 
carbon emissions over the course of this decade. This will be very challenging and will require fundamental changes in so many aspects of Irish life, but the measures contained in this plan and other key domestic plans like the National Development Plan and the Climate Action Plan will help us rise to this challenge. Reflecting our strong national commitment to addressing the climate and biodiversity crisis, uh, the NRRP sees a significant allocation being made to supporting investments addressing the green transition. As detailed in our programme for government, we are committed to a 51% in overall greenhouse gas emissions from 2021 to 2030 compared to 2018 levels and to carbon neutrality by 2050 at the latest. Ireland recognises the importance of front-loading these required investments as many of the changes started in the 2021 to 25 period will only lead to reductions later on in the decade. Ireland is lagging behind, however, compared to other EU member states in tackling decarbonisation. In fact, Ireland is expected to miss its target for cumulative emissions for the period 2013 to 2020 by approximately 5%. This means that proposals and funding are required to substantially reverse recent trends and improve efforts to decarbonise. Our plans will also be crucial for achieving progress towards environmental objectives in line with the European Green Deal. As part of our commitments in the Programme for Government, uh, we will support the European Green Deal, which provides a roadmap for Europe to take advantage of the opportunities uh, by moving to a low-carbon future. Uh, the NRRP represents a first step to significantly reform and direct relevant funding towards decarbonisation projects such as retrofitting, ecosystem resilience and regeneration, climate mitigation and ad uh, adaptation and green data systems. The measures contained in our plan and in other key domestic plans will help us to rise to this challenge. Reflecting the importance of the digital transition for Ireland and Europe in the coming decade, support for Irish businesses and our citizens to adapt to and indeed to reap the benefits from digitalisation will be central to our national recovery and resilience plan. That is why accelerating and expanding digital reforms and transformation is one of the three priorities in our plan. Our ambition is to provide a better experience for citizens and businesses interacting with government and it's important to continue and accelerate the reform agenda through improvements in the way government systems operate. Achieving this requires digital transformation of government, redesigning and rebuilding government processes and services, if necessary, across organisations and using digitalisation and data to provide an integrated experience for our citizens, businesses and our policy makers. Having a user-centred focus on the design and delivery of public services underpinned by exemplary ident identity and data infrastructures will be a key driver of reforms. The benefits of the digital transformation of public services to both individuals and businesses are well established. These range from efficiency, transparency, trust and accessibility through to funds being released for expenditure on improving existing and future services. Realising the potential of digital also requires promoting awareness of the possibilities of digital and strengthening digital skills within organisations and across sectors. Through this approach, we will scale innovation to enable system-wide transformation and reform. Policies and interventions that advance the digital transformation can also be catalysts for wider recovery, growth and increased competitiveness. Having invested in underlying infrastructure, such as the National Broadband Plan, we need to drive adoption and maximise return on that investment while also driving the reform agenda. For the past number of years, Ireland has striven to improve digital connectivity across urban and rural settings to integrate digital services as part of the reform and the transformation of the public service and to promote the benefits of digital transformation across Irish businesses. The digitalisation of our public service is particularly key given the challenges presented by COVID, with the need for remote working, remote transfer of confidential information, and a reduction in gatherings and face-to-face -face consultations. Digital interactions are also less time-consuming for people and reduce the administrative burden on both the public sector and companies, which can help support business as economies recover from the effects of COVID. Moreover, given the scale of case management that occurs across public-facing parts of the government sector, 
automating these components will significantly boost productivity, reducing backlogs and freeing up resources for other priorities. Our digital trans transition will be one of the key enablers for our reform agenda. It will allow greater interoperability of public services within and between organisations nationally as well as across the EU as appropriate. It will improve the quality of service, enable the sharing of information in an efficient manner within the public sector and with citizens and business, thereby enhancing our public administration. Our NRP has a strong focus on supporting people's return to work and preparing for the challenges of the future. This is reflected in our, in our third priority, social and economic recovery and job creation. Further education and training in Ireland has long played a critical role in labour market activation and in upskilling and reskilling our people. The requirements on the FET sector are particularly acute given the enormous impact of COVID on the social and economic fabric of Ireland. In particular, certain sectors and occupations have been impacted greatly, such as hospitality, services and indeed retail. Additional skills challenges relating to climate, Brexit and automation also exist. Recognising these challenges, we have strengthened the mandate and the governance of this sector through the establishment of the Department of Further and Higher Education, Research, Innovation and Science. This department will drive the reforms required to ensure Ireland is equipped to upskill and reskill the workforce and to provide skills for growing sectors such as green and digital. We've introduced investments in further uh, education aimed at upskilling, reskilling, retraining and providing experience to individuals to enable them to avail of the new employment opportunities that are arising. Additional government investment in vocational and further education was first announced in July of last year in the stimulus package to help people to reskill and if necessary to change career. This was further supported with additional further education and training places announced in the budget in last October. This priority area in Ireland's plan will focus on new work placements in response to the COVID pandemic in order to keep those who are unemployed close to the labour market. It will also focus on equipping our workforce with the necessary future skills that will be required to boost innovation and productivity in our SME sector, as well as the provision of skills in support of climate action. This commitment to reforming the focus of FET to meet the future employment that Ireland strives to advance in climate action and digitisation will ensure there is strong alignment between the development of physical capital and our human capital. Ireland recognises the critical role that Next Generation EU and the Recovery and Resilience Facility will play in helping to repair the immediate economic and social damage brought by, by the pandemic. But more than that, they will enable us to move beyond the pandemic and rebuild the European economy. For Ireland, as a successful, open and global economy at the heart of the EU, uh, this is fundamental to our future interests. And I would like again to thank the Commissioner and his team for their outstanding cooperation in developing our plan. And now we move to the next phase, which is one of implementation. And this phase will be led by myself and my own department in close cooperation with Minister Donoghue and the Department of Finance. And I look forward to continuing, uh, no doubt, with good cooperation with the Commissioner uh, and his team during those critical phase. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. It's a, it's, a, it's a huge agenda and it's great to see the word alignment being used so often because very often, Commissioner, we've had policies in Ireland which have been very good enough themselves, but actually they haven't aligned across the base. And one of the things of having a national development plan is we're, we're more aware of the need and the importance of actually doing that. So I think this is a really, really great strength. Um, so could I just remind the audience that um, if you have questions to please send them in through the, through the function on Zoom and we'll come to them as, as, as we go forward. But I'm going to start with the question actually to you, Minister, um, for a moment and you'll know why I'm asking it because it's very current and as you'd expect we always like to do, deal with the current. Um, in the past 24 hours we've seen some significant developments in relation to the future of Ireland's corporate tax strategy. Um, early yesterday the American Chamber of Commerce um, which represents key um, multinationals in Ireland, came out with the view that, um, th well, they really changed their position in relation to 12.5% and really urged Ireland to be part of the global tax deal 
and not as they had done earlier to stick to what uh, had, they, had, they had wanted previously. Uh, and the, the issue there, I think, is around giving certainty to multinationals. And I think one of the things that a lot of Irish people don't realise is just how important certainty in policy making has been in Ireland over 50 years. So, of course, we're slow to change. But when we change, we want to give certainty and let everybody know where we're going. It's a very important part of our strategy. And then, of course, last evening, the Taoiseach, speaking from New York, sent a message which indicated that Ireland wouldn't necessarily be sticking to its tradition, its, its position in relation to the 12.5%, and that it was, a, it was engaging very actively in discussions with the OECD. And I know, Minister, you're very much engaged in that, in that process as well with Minister Donoghue. So I, my question really to you is what impact do you see the Taoiseach statements as having on the timeline for discussions of these issues? Um, for example, would you see a decisive change being indicated ahead of the OECD meetings in October, or do you think it will be in tandem with them? Do you have a sense of the timeline that Ireland will want to pursue? Because for us, and, and the Commissioner will appreciate this, it has been a, a, a major part of our policy. I did my PhD in this area 40 years ago, so I've been around a long time, and this has been a very strong plank, and it's been very consistent. I mean, we've very unusual in globally in the extent to which we've had consistent policy. So I was just wondering, Minister, if you might be able to see, give us some indication of your thoughts at this stage, if you have them, on relation sure. to the developments of the last 24 hours. Thank you, uh, Francis, for, for the question. And it is the unavoidable uh, issue uh, that is the subject of much public commentary. And I think that the Taoiseach's um, uh, answer to the question that he was asked reflects the fact that there is uh, a process that is well underway. And I think Ireland has uh, adopted through the leadership of Minister Pascal Donoghue uh, a very considered and a very measured approach uh, to the entire process. Uh, we have made it clear that we want to be part of uh, an overall agreement. And of course, there are, are two pillars to all of this. And uh, pillar one is one that Ireland is actively supporting, which is the reallocation of taxing rights of multinationals based on where the substantive economic activity is taking place. And signing up to that will come at a cost to Ireland, uh, and it is a cost that we have quantified, as you know, um, which will materialise over the next number of years if that comes to fruition. Uh, pillar two is the one where we continue to have significant concerns uh, about the minimum effective global rate uh, of corporate tax. And for us, the key question is, uh, we need absolute certainty as to what we are being asked to sign up to. And these discussions are continuing and we are now entering into a critical uh, number of weeks and Minister Donoghue has briefed the party leaders and myself on uh, the detail of what is happening uh, in the background. And so he's representing uh, our interests as you would expect him to do. Uh, we will ultimately make a judgment call when we have all of the facts and all of the information as to what exactly is going to emerge from this process. And there are lots of moving parts, of course, uh, not just uh, on this side of the Atlantic in the European Union, but also in the United States. And we are monitoring all of that uh, closely. And of course, the, the Taoiseach uh, is currently uh, in New York as well. So uh, I think the next number of weeks will be critical uh, as the OECD moves towards, um, from its perspective, trying to reach an agreement uh, in the early part of October uh, and then the further meetings at G20 level and so on uh, later in October. So at this point, Ireland cannot commit to signing up um, because it is not entirely clear what exactly are we are being asked to sign up to. Uh, and we do have to protect our national interests. And you have rightly, I think, underlined the, the strategic importance of certainty. And we currently you know, have a policy which has been there now for a very long time. In many respects, it has been the bedrock of Ireland's foreign direct uh, investment policy, which has been hugely successful. Though, of, of course, tax is only one factor. It's not the only factor. And if we're being asked to sign up to uh, an alternative, then we need to know exactly what it is. And we're not quite at that point yet, because if, uh, if we're being asked to leave behind one chapter of really successful period of certainty and stability, we need to know what we're getting into. And we're not quite at that point yet. And uh, hopefully in the weeks ahead, uh, there will be full clarity on, on what that package is. And Minister, just to, to clarify that, is that around the, I mean, we understand the numbers because we can all work out 12.5% and 15% and we know those, those, those numbers well. Uh, is it around the base? Is that really where the concerns are, the uncertainty that you're concerned about at the moment? 
So that there are lots of, of detailed technical discussions that sit underneath, in many respects, the, the headline issues that are being debated publicly. And uh, those include, of course, the, the calculation of the base, because while you know, Ireland has a very low headline rate in relative terms, that is applied to a very broad base. And many other countries have a higher rate, but a much narrower base. And of course, the, the detail of how all of that is going to work through in a final plan uh, will be really important. And so Ireland's being represented in, in all of those technical discussions, uh, as you would expect. So uh, for us, the need for, for as much clarity and certainty as possible is absolutely vital before we make a final decision um, because uh, it, you know, the 12.5% rate and the environment in which it has been protected has been instrumental in the success we have had in foreign direct investment uh, and we are determined to protect that success. Um, you don't want to come in to discuss anything of this matter, Commissioner. Would you like to make any remarks in relation to the development since you well, arrived? Well, very arrival? briefly because, yeah. of course, I, I had the opportunity in these couple of days of discussing the issue uh, with uh, uh, Michael McGrath, with the um, ministers, stakeholders, and especially with uh, Pascal uh, Donahue, um, uh, who, of course, as president of the Eurogroup, I am uh, working, with, working with very frequently. Uh, only two points. First, um, we consider this um, the possibility of a global agreement on uh, taxation uh, as a very important step forward for the global community. Um, it was not uh, uh, so near um, only uh, six months ago. Uh, I think we should be very honest on this. Uh, something happened. Uh, uh, the, the new US administration, to, be, to put it very bluntly, uh, took the initiative uh, and gave to the process a new boost. Um, this process in itself, uh, I think, is a positive one. Reallocation of taxing rights and creating a global framework uh, for minimal uh, taxation. This gives stability and predictability to the system all over the world. Second point, of course, I uh, perfectly understand and now I know very well uh, the uh, challenges that this, um, particularly the, the so-called Pillar 2, uh, creates for uh, Ireland, uh, the difficulty of the decision to the, be, be taken, and the importance of taking this decision, having all the details, then we call details something mm -hmm. that are not uh, always details, so having clarity of what we are talking about, so I fully understand the, what um, between the Irish government and the OECD is going on to try to clarify these uh, so-called details. Uh, and then uh, we will have as European Union the task to transpose this OECD agreement, not a different thing, but this uh, OECD agreement in the EU legislation. And this will be uh, our task, but we need, of course, the uh, agreement of all member states. And this is the reason why also we are very interested on uh, this process, respecting the importance of the process. Uh, as Pascal always repeat, we are in the process, we are not yet uh, uh, in the agreement. And this is what is the situation is. I hope in, that in the next period, we can have a new uh, step forward, but this is to the Irish government to decide mm -hmm. and not to the Commission, of course. I just think it was an interesting development for Ireland that the multinationals really have, have now looked to get, get certainty. And I think that actually, I think, is enormously helpful, probably, from an Ireland's perspective, because that voice had been very strong on the other side for a very long period. So I think that, that development is, I think, is, is, is helpful to getting sort of onboarding these ideas. Um, Commissioner, there's a, a question into you from Kevin Callan, who's the General Secretary of FORSA, which is one of our big unions. And he asked the following, 
Would Commissioner Gentiloni agree that the review of EU economic governance mentioned by Pre President van der Leyen last week will need to result in more flexibility for countries like Ireland to permit borrowing at favourable conditions for investment in the infrastructure and public services necessary to achieve social cohesion and for measures that will support competitiveness, allowing the economy to reach its potential? Uh, well, to put it shortly, my answer is yes. Um, to make it a little bit more uh, articulate, I would say that this is, uh, will be for sure one of the main uh, work stream uh, in this discussion of, the, of our fiscal rules. Uh, de facto, we began this discussion already uh, 10 days ago in an informal meeting of finance minister in Slovenia uh, with a paper presented by uh, Guntram Wolf, uh, the director of the Bregel uh, think tank, on um, uh, special treatment in our fiscal rules of uh, green investments. So it's clear, I think, that we can't repeat what happened with the previous crisis. What happened with the previous crisis is that gradually uh, member states uh, reduced the level of their net investment. And at the end of the decade, in 2017, 2018, the level of public investment was zero on average. If we take this and all uh, the commitment that we have in the transitions and uh, Michael was referring before to the uh, green transition, what this means. Well, here, of course, we need mostly private investment, but also a substantial amount of public investment. Uh, are we able to give to this uh, kind of public investment a more uh, easy uh, way from a fiscal point of view? with our fiscal rules. I think that this is quite possible and the first discussion that we, have, um, we had among finance ministers was rather encouraging. So yes, this is a problem that we should face and we have some new tools, for example, the taxonomies that we, sorry for the name, mm -hmm. um, the taxonomies that we adopted um, for the next generation EU plans uh, to define what is a green investment, for example, um, and also for the digital, these taxonomies will be very useful if we decide to give a, a sort of uh, facilitate way uh, to uh, green or digital investments. So yes, it will be one of the issues that we will discuss in the next months. Minister, did you want to make any remark on that in relation to that? I think one of the real learnings from the last crisis is the need to protect capital investment and you know as as the commissioner has alluded to right across Europe one of the the real victims of the crisis was public capital investment yeah. in Ireland in Ireland it fell by about 60 percent from peak to trough and when you take out the necessary spend on maintenance then that meant you had very little net new investment in infrastructure and thankfully, we are now in a very different environment because of the accommodative policies of the European Central Bank and the very supportive policies of the other European institutions. And I think that the, uh, the rethinking of the fiscal rules uh, in the next uh, period ahead should reflect that investment in infrastructure, productive uh, investment in infrastructure, is a priority and has to be accommodated uh, within the fiscal rules framework. And I think that that is um, the point that, that Kevin is making there. And he alludes, of course, to, to public services as well. But from my perspective as the minister in charge of the National Development Plan, uh, you know, I don't want to see future ministers be in a situation where they are uh, at, you know, at the mercy of the economic cycle whereby mm -hmm. capital projects just have to be stalled or, or, or completely stopped. Yeah. Um, because that impacts on our ability to recover. We need a good 
a strong commitment to steady state investment in infrastructure. So in the next three weeks, we will unveil the new national development plan in Ireland, which will lay out the plan out to 2030. And the cabinet agreed uh, in July to the overall financial envelope for that, uh, which is 165 billion euro. So next year, for example, we will invest 11 billion euro in the public capital program. Uh, and only, only a short few years ago, that was 4 billion euro. So we've seen the scale of the increase and now the challenge is to make sure we get value for money, that we have the capacity within the system to deliver uh, on that infrastructure uh, and to try to unlock some of the bottlenecks that have arisen. And there's a lot of heat in that market at this time, as you know, uh, not least because of the, you know, the impact on the economy for 18 months. Uh, there's a lot of pent up demand for, for construction activity. So there are challenges, but for me, uh, preserving the public capital investment program and protecting it and enshrining it in the new fiscal rules framework that will hopefully emerge uh, out of the pandemic is really important. So, so, Minister, how do you see Ireland approaching the upcoming debate on the fiscal rules? Um, I don't know whether you saw that, the view expressed in the letter signed by eight finance ministers who were looking to sort of you know, draw a distinction, a deactivation, if you like, of the general escape clause and reform of the, the um, stability and growth path, that these should not be linked. Do you think that that's an issue that Ireland would, would for Ireland? So I think from our perspective, we came into the COVID crisis uh, in, in good health mm -hmm. in terms of the public finances. We were you know, broadly balanced uh, and that gave us the capacity then to uh, borrow in the way that we have done uh, to support people's incomes, to support businesses and to try to help our economy to absorb uh, the enormous shock. So the uh, generous gate clause and the support of the ECB, the Commission uh, and all of the other uh, international bodies I think has been really important uh, in that regard. Uh, I think you need a certain level of flexibility within the rules. Mm -hmm. I think if you have rules that are overly rigid and don't take account of uh, domestic national circumstances. I think that can be problematic if they're overly prescriptive. Uh, I think that there, that, so there's a need, I think, to, to, to bring that element into the rules that takes account of uh, a country's specific circumstances while, all, while certainly working towards, for example, the medium term objective mm -hmm. in relation to uh, a budget deficit and the need to consistently make progress towards that. And I think the Commission will have a very important role in approving national plans into the future when it comes to uh, um, how you get to that path. I mean, I'm just, there's a question in from Dan O'Brien from the IAEA to the Commissioner asking whether um, he sees the um, traditional positions of each of the member states on the fiscal rules as being largely unchanged, or do you think that um, mostly the northern countries uh, who've been um, hostile to deficit financing are kind of shifting the position? Do you think there's a more unity across uni Europe, across the countries who've been to some extent in different places on this issue? Well, uh, for sure there was uh, more unity during the emergency period, mm -hmm. the pandemic, uh, and this unity allowed us uh, uh, to propose as commission and then allows the, the governments to decide uh, on this, uh, what we are discussing here, yes. the, the yeah. next generation EU and other initiatives. Um, I think we should recognize this and also be proud of this. The reaction was fast, strong. Um, you were referring before to the general escape clause and I remember very well how uh, difficult but fast was the decision to introduce, to use, it was, had never been used before, uh, this general escape clause and it was introduced I think in March the 16th or 17th, so exactly at the beginning of the pandemic in 2020. Um, then these different positions are rooted, of course, in uh, different countries. Uh, we can't imagine that the fact that we showed solidarity also in the interest of the single market, not only in the interest of solidarity, uh, has cancelled these differences. They are still there, but um, I also see uh, a window of opportunity if uh, we address this problem uh, not with a backward 
looking attitude. So we are not reopening the debate that we had in the previous 10 years. Yeah. Uh, we are trying to address uh, two main new problems. First, the enormous task of transformation of our economies in the digital and in the climate transition. And second, we have to uh, manage an extraordinary high level of debt uh, that was created by the pandemic. I think that there is a consensus on the fact that these two big, big problems have to be faced. And this is the premise, to put the discussion, if possible, in a different perspective from the previous uh, differences. It will not be easy. It also depends on several political circumstances, of course. Yeah. Uh, we have a window of opportunity between the German elections and the French election, for example, <laughs> to table some proposals. We will see. I am yeah. optimistic because if you are uh, in politics, you need to be optimistic. <laughs> And you're Italian, and Italians are optimistic. And Italians are <laughs> optimistic, but also Irish are optimistic. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think, we're, I think we're well matched on yeah. that. Difficulty, but not just we're on the sports field, but uh, otherwise we're pretty, pretty good on it. Just, just that, that issue of how the, I guess the Commission, how, how if you like, collectively Europe responds and how the Commission man, manages that. I mean, you mentioned in your, in your speech, and, and, and the Minister touched on it as well, the sort of reform objectives that are contained in the next generation EU and the issue of, you know, that they need to be adhered to uh, insofar as the, the, the funding is, is going. I'm just wondering how, you know, how strong the Commission feels about this reform agenda and the extent to which it would restrict funding if they didn't follow what they set out as their objectives in their, in their recovery and resilience programmes. Well, in general, I think uh, the awareness should be uh, of the extraordinary opportunity that we have, which is not only an opportunity of uh, going out of the emergency. Uh, it is a paradox, but I am quite convinced of the fact that um, the long time that was necessary to take the decision, because we proposed this next generation EU in May, uh, 2020, uh, the Commission, and then the, the, the first um, money um, is arriving, uh, arrived in July 2021, so after 14 months, a long period. Okay, but this very fact, paradoxically, is a good one, because it is clear that uh, this money is not for emergency. Emergency was uh, faced by national governments, also thanks to the decision taken by the ECB and by the European institution. Now this money should be used for this extraordinary opportunity to make our economies more sustainable, uh, inclusive and competitive. It's now or never. I don't think that our generation will have another opportunity, well, not my generation, but maybe also uh, Michael's generation, uh, will not have such an important opportunity to make this progress. We were mentioning before the figures of growth. If we look to um, the, the, the perspective of growth of uh, Europe, China and US, uh, they, they've never been um, with less uh, distance that, that now in the last 20 years. Uh, so we have an opportunity to go out of this situation that we called low for long. Low growth, low interest rates, low inflation and non-sufficient competitiveness and sustainability in Europe. Mm -hmm. The opportunity is now and it is based not only on investments. Investments are important but in several countries and mostly also in countries that are receiving larger part of this funding, mm -hmm. uh, reforms are, uh, I would say, even more important than uh, investment. 
the Commission has, for the first time, uh, not only a, a power of uh, uh, regulation, of influence, but also power of money, uh, firepower. Yeah. We should use it uh, as well as possible. I think, I think uh, that's why I always think the Minister is very lucky that he has um, public sector reform in his title as well as public expenditure because I think there's a sense in which if you don't, have, if you don't link reform to expenditure, um, I think the evidence globally is very little, very little happens. I've just a quick sort of question to both of you. Uh, this is since you both admitted to being optimists a moment ago. Um, so uh, when, when 2026 comes around and the last funds from the next generation EU have been dispersed both to Ireland and the EU and indeed we're looking forward to, to 2030 and beyond, what would you think from just a, you know, at a very, very high level uh, you would see as su success looking like for this project in terms of Europe? Where do you think we would, we would like to be? And maybe the Minister would ask in, in relation to Ireland and uh, Commissioner, you might say a few words just in relation to uh, the European Union overall. Like what, what's this going to look like? Because as you rightly point out, it is a very different step. So maybe Minister, you'll start sure. with Ireland. Well, from, from our perspective, it's part of an overall mix of policies that we expect will lead us in the direction where we want to go. And that is to, uh, first of all, secure economic recovery after uh, a devastating shock imposed by, by COVID. And we should bear in mind that this plan is about achieving recovery after COVID. So I think in Ireland, we've made a very good start. We're seeing the number of people on the emergency uh, pandemic unemployment payment uh, fall very significantly. Uh, we now have a very ambitious Pathways to Work programme that will enable us to help the remaining people uh, to find work and also to help people currently in the workforce uh, to change their employment because there will be new opportunities uh, emerging and some sectors are going to experience long-term change where there may be less opportunity in some areas, more opportunity in other areas. Uh, and we see enormous opportunity in the green transition, mm -hmm. uh, for example, in, in retrofitting uh, both our public sector building stock, uh, our residential stock, uh, and also in digitalization. And we, when you look at the success we're having uh, in, in terms of FDI, uh, then I think you can certainly see uh, a synergy and an overlap there. So for me, it is about uh, Ireland's National Recovery and Resilience Plan, helping us to implement our national economic plan in Ireland, which aims that by 2023, uh, we will have surpassed the pre-COVID level of employment. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have to get our public finances back into safe territory. That means reducing the deficit gradually mm -hmm. over the next number of years. That won't be easy. Uh, for me, it means the, the saying unwinding, no. Uh, saying no, it does indeed involve saying no. And it means in the short term, you know, putting train the, the unwinding of the exceptional COVID related spending, because that, that's what helps to get us back uh, towards safe territory. Uh, and then on the climate action side, you know, Ireland's um, National Recovery and Resilience Plan funded here by the European Union will play a really important role in driving the change across enterprises, across transport, across energy policy. We're going to provide direct grants to businesses now uh, through this EU funding uh, to help them to make the transition. So when I look at our own recovery plan, uh, the EU funded recovery and resilience plan, the national development plan, the Climate Action Plan, it is all about getting us to a point where our economy is uh, on a sustainable footing, public finances are back in, in safe territory, and undoubtedly this plan will help us to achieve all of that. So Commissioner, a few words. I know you have a plane to catch and the Minister has to be the far side of town, although you'd never guess. Um, uh, anything you'd like to say in terms of what you think the EU, you know, what would this look like if you were to say this was really successful? What would, what would be your well, I don't want to design a utopia. No, you're not designing, but what does the feel, what does this feel like from an EU My point European is, uh, we are not uh, only working for a uh, rebound. Um, what does this mean? I think an added value from this uh, common money, added value in uh, mostly uh, three or four dimensions. The first is the climate transition. We can use this money 
and the fact that we are concentrated almost 40% of this money on the green transition to strengthen our position of uh, leaders at global level of this climate transition. Of course, this will not solve the, the, uh, the green uh, challenge because we know that only 7% of emissions are coming from the EU. But we also know from the experience of these years that if we take the lead, other countries uh, could take this example. So first, strengthen our, all our efforts on how we move, uh, how we uh, deal with our housing, uh, heating, etc., etc., etc. Second, uh, our digital competitiveness, efficiency, um, digital divide, but also global competitiveness. Mm -hmm. We are lagging behind from this point of view. And we have several projects, cross-border projects, unifying forces among member states to create the critical mass to be competitive in the digital arena. And thirdly, to have uh, this lesson learned also of the necessity during this crisis to have social inclusiveness, uh, good functioning of healthcare systems. Mm -hmm. So this kind of Europe uh, leading the green transition, more competitive uh, on the digital uh, future and with a, a stronger social demand uh, dimension is possible with this kind of common investments if they are targeted and if they are linked to reform. If this works, we will have higher growth. Um, and uh, numbers will show us if it has worked, if it is not only a rebound. We will look at this from numbers and we will know that these numbers have behind a more sustainable and inclusive growth. Yeah, I think it is really an issue that the sort of, it's not just a question of the macro, it is the numbers, the macro numbers, but it is the economic development that takes place yes, below the macro. Numbers, it's what course. behind it that really, really matters. Well, ladies and gentlemen who are watching online, um, I think uh, we've had a very interesting discussion of the, the, the next generation EU. I think it's, it's a really important collective recovery fund. I think it, it is, to me, what strikes me is that in, in a few years' time, we would hope that that sense of being more European in some of these efforts would be, would be felt more strongly. Um, and I think what it has shown, though, is that the EU can work together um, to address a, a common crisis. I don't think we've wasted this crisis at all. Um, arguably, we, 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 some of us may have wasted a little bit of the last crisis. Um, but we deal with the crisis and then support the long-term long -term objectives uh, for, for, for the European Union. Um, and I want to thank you, Minister and, and Commissioner, for your time today. Um, and could I just say to those of you who are watching in, if you have friends or colleagues who are not able to attend online today, that you can let them know that the webinar will be accessible on the IIEA's YouTube channel and the audio of the events will be uploaded on the IIEA's SoundCloud, Spotify, Google Podcast and Apple Podcast accounts. So you have no excuse for not uh, <laughs> seeing it or hearing it if you haven't. So thank you all very much for this afternoon and thank you both again, thank you. Uh, Commissioner and Minister. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much.